Okay, this is Dr. Martin um, uh, recording a, a new video here in uh, spring of uh, 21. It's uh, the 29th of March, uh, so almost April, not quite. Um, and I'm going to talk about the final project because your uh, final project proposals are due tomorrow. And uh, there, there is a link on Blackboard, which I will uh, set up right now. Let's see. Let's do that. Let's see. No. Sorry. Yeah, here, let's do. Let's bring that up. Let me pause this for a second here. If you scroll down to... Uh, 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 project, project proposal, proposal turn in. Oh, let's see. For some reason, no, it should be fine. Let's see. Okay, now it'll be. Yeah, and then you click on that, and then there's a link where you can turn it in, and you just uh, you submit you. Uh, Yeah, so you, you, you click on the final proposal form here, and uh, it looks like this. And you, you put in your team members. Remember, you can have up to three team members, but you can't add them after tomorrow. So whatever you put on here, that, that's the max you can have. Now you can drop team members. And then they can submit their own proposals if they decide not to. If you decide not to be a team, but you can't add new ones. So if you have two and you want to add a third in a couple of weeks, I, I might let you do that uh, if you explain the rationale and it makes some sense. But basically, uh, that's not allowed except unless I give you permission. And then project title, project description, and then talk about the various modules used: uh, A to D converter, GPIO pins. Uh, interface a GPS module or an accelerometer or something like that and then kind of what you consider halfway done and when that's going to be um, and we will take this data out of here since that's kind of stupid and um, we'll fix that um, anyway okay so um, yeah that's well put this in and uh, Marco one, which is somewhere here. So sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. So then, and then you just uh, then you just submit it. And I think you can just paste it in there or whatever. All right. Um, and then uh, there's also a video. Uh, I went back and looked, uh, and I, I'm going to do this video anyway, but there is one you can go back and look at that's got some of this in there. I'm going to give a little more anyway because this wasn't all that great. But uh, if you go down to video 12, uh, from minute 42 on, it talks about final projects. So you can look at that again, just the last uh, 11 minutes, I think. All right. Okay, and then... All right. So final projects. So uh, I'm I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how you uh, not so much the practicum, but but uh, how you actually um, uh, come up with an idea a little bit, and then uh, so when you do a project using microprocessor involves several parts. Okay, there's the overall system design, kind of what you're doing, and and all the various pieces, what the user interface is going to look like, and uh, and then what, what processes you're actually going to, to implement. And then you have to write your software, your firmware. Uh, we usually call it firmware when it's in an embedded design. And then how you're going to support that uh, over time with updates and you know uh, new features or whatever. The firmware means you, um, let's see, let me slip this out. The firmware means that you need to know how to write code and understand how to implement algorithms in the code. And this is sort of hard to teach because, um, because coming up with your algorithm is, is kind of, it's, there's a lot of creativity involved in that. And then the more you do it, the, more, the better you get at doing it. And obviously at some point you can 
you know, there are certain parts of an algorithm that would be similar to other algorithms, and, and you could just remember how you did that before and just do it the same way or slightly modified. And in getting this, this algorithm, you really have to move from a big picture to the details as opposed to the details up to the big picture. In this case, you, you really have to, you have to sort of have the big concept of what you want to do, and you have to be able to, uh, to sort of break that down into how you get that done, as opposed to thinking of little details and building them up. So it's, it's uh, yeah. So there's some series of steps typically to, to accomplish this. Often it, it may involve some calculation, like if you're going to do a temperature, you have to take a voltage, A to D it, and then you have to turn that voltage into a temperature reading, maybe in Fahrenheit, maybe in centigrade. Uh, you may have to collect data and process it and then use that data in some way, like uh, in Micro 2, we, we balance a steel ball on a tilt table. So one of the first things we have to do is find out where the ball is, uh, collect position information about the ball, and then uh, as then as we save as we save some of that position information, we have to uh, create uh, inputs to our PID controller to uh, to generate a proportional response, a differential response, and an integral response. And uh, so, and then obviously these days we're getting into deep learning. We're getting into uh, you know uh, TensorFlow sorts of things where you have all sorts of big data and you can bring all sorts of tools to bear on it. And, and look for pattern recognition and, and, and all, all sorts of various ways of processing this data. Um, the, uh, so typically, uh, these steps are ordered and, um, and the steps have to be codable. In other words, uh, you can't have a concept but not, not be able to translate that into code. And sometimes this idea, I want to do this, then, con then translating that into code can, can be a little bit challenging. And, you might need some help, and that's fine. That's what we're there for. We'll be there. Uh, we're there Thursdays up in Lab 3, uh, up in the third floor lab on the elevator side for Micro 2, but there aren't very many people that come in. So, uh, and then Friday we're down, downstairs in the second floor lab for Micro 1 all the time. So you can come up and find us in, on Thursday if you want it on third floor. Um, it's really good if you can break your tasks down into little pieces and then and then encode those separately and have them be more or less self-contained. That usually that usually works really well if you can make that happen. Okay, um, so the steps have to flow from a high level understanding of the task, uh, and one of the keys is to clearly define the task. If you don't really understand how the task works, then that's going to make it very difficult to to code it and to develop it. So you, you do have to have a pretty good understanding of what it is you're trying to do. Then you also need to um, you need to uh, consider several different approaches. I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've just gone off, you know, kind of half cocked uh, to implement some sort of a task, wrote a bunch of code, and then thought, oh no, there's a so much easier way to do this. Why didn't I do that first? And so I really encourage you before you start writing code. Think through the task critically, and and come up with uh, with several uh, different approaches you might consider. And you might find that if you as you think about it, you'll come up with one that's a whole lot simpler than a lot of others. Uh, think about the trade-offs involved in your in your project. Like, like for instance, instance uh, you know it needs to be fast, so maybe you can't write that you know one million line uh, you know uh, piece of software. Um, Think about think think about the submodules and and try and avoid making any submodules super complicated so that it's kind of a you know a whole system in itself. Break them down into small bite-sized pieces so you can easily accomplish those. And then then all you have to do is do the function call and you can build it up. And uh, your main routine can simply be a you know maybe six function calls and you're done. Uh, make sure your code is easy to follow versus you know, super clever that nobody can see exactly what you were doing. Get it done versus elegant. Sometimes, uh, you know, spending a whole bunch of time to make it cool uh, really takes away from just getting it done. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had discussions with students and I show them, no, just do it this way. And then, no, no, but I want to do this and this and this. 
Well, yeah, but by the time you write that, you could have had this done 10 times. Just just do this. And a uh, a lot of times elegant is the, you know, better is the you know, better is the enemy of best or good. So keep that in mind. Also, uh, think of, as you build it, think about things you might want to do later as enhancements and and make it so you could add those things in. Leave in some hooks for those future enhancements. Uh, if you simply if you oversimplify the code, it may be really difficult to enhance it the way you're thinking that you might do later. So keep that in mind as you do it. You don't have to do the enhancements, but just make it possible that you could come back and do them without having to rewrite the whole thing. Again, think through each step required in detail, and then visualize the desired output, and uh, make sure that the, the approach you've thought about will get you to that desired output. And then you should ask questions about other approaches. Again, back up to here. Consider several different approaches. You should revisit this all the time as you're developing your, 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 your system, your design. It's, it's really smart, smart to have a block diagram. I'm, I, am, I am not a big fan of a detailed flowchart. I think that's, you know, in, when I learned how to code, uh, we had to write flowcharts before we wrote a single line of code. And I, I felt it was really um, not all that helpful. So I, I, I'm not a big flowchart, uh, you know, I'm not a big flowchart proponent. But I do believe in block diagrams. And I think, you know, you do kind of need to, uh, to have some sort of idea of how the data flows, how your control flows. And a lot of times we want to, you know, our data, our data, our data logic is, is often separated from our control logic in order to, uh, you know, to, to, to help things, uh, you know, to have a, work, that's a good logical division of your work. And so that's always a good one to implement. So here's a flow chart. Start step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. Yes, go to step 6A. No, go to step 6B, and then you're done. So a simple flow chart that just lays out, here's your block diagram, and here's how your, here's how your, your procedure for, you know, for, for using the hardware over here and getting, you know, the result. And a lot of times, uh, a little detail about the user interface is also good to include here. Uh, at what point do you talk to the user? At what point does the user have inputs into your into this flow. But again, I, I wouldn't encourage you to spend a tremendous amount of time. Just, you know, get some basic some basic idea of how the software is going to flow. Okay. So in the end, you learn to solve problems by solving problems. And that's why I assign special projects. We didn't do the in-class practicum because um, we didn't have class. But normally, I make you, in an hour, uh, you know, basically solve, uh, start from scratch and solve a design. And the last time I did this in class for real before COVID hit, I was impressed at how, how what a great job the students did. And so it really taught me that indeed students can do this. And it's, it's very, uh, it's very egocentric for you to sit down in class, get a problem thrown in, thrown in, you know, thrown in your face and have a team of maybe two people or three people and just knock it out in about 15 minutes and, you know, impress your instructor. That's really very, uh, that's something that really builds confidence. And I, I just love to see that. Uh, and if you go the whole period and you can't figure it out, well, okay, then that's a good benchmark to t show you where you need to do some work. And these things are, these are learned skills. Obviously, uh, you don't learn to solve problems, uh, uh, you know, at super high level right out of the box, you have to start solving simpler problems and then you slowly but surely get better and better at so that you can tackle really complicated problems and come up with really good solutions to them as opposed to a kludge that, you know, doesn't really work very well. All right. Um, so, yeah, so uh, we kind of done this in lab. But, so we have a temp probe, we connect it with an analog input and then we calculate the temperature from the voltage and output it to LCD display using the I2C bus. So it involves temp sensor, L2C, LCD display, um, I2C bus, and protocol, and an A to D peripheral module. So you've got a couple of peripheral modules and two, and two additional added in uh, pieces of hardware. Now you have a temp sensor on your analog board, so you can always use that. You've got an LCD display. So basically, 
this is a this is a project you can do with no additional hardware. Um, all right, I'm going to go through um, some of the sensors that are available to you. I have I have a whole bunch of parts, uh, multiple copies of most of them, and you can you can you can borrow them. Uh, you can if, if they're all relatively cheap. Uh, maybe four or five dollars kind of thing, maybe a little bit more for GPS modules, but none of them are horribly expensive. And, uh, and if you give them back to me, yeah, you can use them and that's fine, you don't have to pay a thing. If, if you, you want, want to keep, keep them, I'd like you to give me the two or four or five bucks or for some of them a little bit more, but, uh, but you don't even have to do that. I, you know, I usually go out and buy more every semester anyway, but I'd like to get them back if you're not gonna keep them and use them. Um, so there's a, there's a pot already on your uh, analog uh, board that you can use. And there's also a, uh, uh, a photoresistor. And you've used those already in lab, so you should know how to do that. Uh, there are two colored LEDs. You've got an onboard three colored LED, the RGB LED. Uh, so they're real-time clocks. Uh, th uh, they mostly come in an I2C interface. There are other types, however. Uh, they're, again, temp, temp sensor, sensor you have on your analog board. But, but if you, you want to do something with a remote tense, uh, you know, with a you need a temp sensor and a little bit of a cord, I'll give you a, I'll give you one that's loose all by itself, and you can, and you can put it on a on a little bit of an extended. Um, you can put a hook it up with Dupont leads, and and uh, one of the things I'll talk about in a minute is doing a little uh, proofing oven for uh, raising bread or maybe for hatching out eggs. Uh, so an incubator. Where you need to control the temperature, and you create a little um, styrofoam box. You put a uh, you put a uh, an incandescent bulb in there, maybe a 60 watt bulb, and uh, in a styrofoam box, a 60 watt bulb will heat it up really fast. So what you do is you sense the temperature in there with a temperature sensor. You read that with your micro, and then your your Viva board either turns on or off the light using a solid state relay. Um, and you can display the temperature on an LCD display, and, uh, and that's a great little project. Um, again, you can interface accelerometers with I2C. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can interface. Um, and um, yeah, I have a bunch of ping sensors. These measure distance using ultrasound out to about uh, seven or eight, nine meters, something like that. And you can use this to, to measure. You can hook it up with your LCD display and display the distance, and it can be pretty cool. Uh, uh, I have a bunch of servos you can borrow on and PWM to do something. Uh, there, there are uh, real-time clock modules that you can, well, you can use your onboard timer modules. Um, you can use your onboard D to A output where you output a uh, analog signal from, a, from uh, you generate inside your Viva board. Uh, uh, the USB interface, you can do, you have to use the, the RS-232 dongle, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the CR-2102 dongle. Uh, you can do an I or remote reader. I have some of those. They use the NEC protocol. Uh, you do have to bit bang that because you don't have a module for that. Uh, but you learn a tremendous amount doing that. I have RFID readers that are I2C interface. I have GPS receivers that are UART interface. Uh, I have uh, passive infrared sensors you can use, joysticks, Bluetooth modules you can plug in instead of the CR2102. And then you can talk to your Viva board with your cell phone. And you can you can do that on either uh, an Apple or you can do it on a uh, uh, on a uh, uh, Samsung or whatever I forget the interface they use. Photoresistors on your analog board. Uh, you can send signals using an IRD LED pair. Uh, I have I, I I have if you want to do that I have those parts too. Uh, you, there's some RF modules that you can use to communicate. Uh, you can uh, uh, you can interface a touch panel and just it goes on and on. There's almost no list limit. Um, your proposal needs to say again what you're going to do, all the devices, interface, and modules you're going to use, and and all the group members. Remember every every proposal has to include either the LCD display or a CR2102 dongle to a terminal program so you can talk to the desktop or laptop or um, you can use an OLED display. I have some of those if you want to borrow one of those and use it. You're, they're, due, uh, they're due on uh, Tuesday, uh, the March 30th. That's tomorrow. Um, probably today by the time you're looking at this. 
uh, by midnight. And if you turn it in late, that's okay, but I'd like, I'd like you to make a real effort to get it in tomorrow, and then if you want to update it, you can do that. Um, and then you should start a little notebook to just keep track of what you do and, and problems you have. Uh, I, I'd like you to make a little poster, um, and uh, I'll probably have you submit that as part of your uh, final project uh, report. And it just uh, uh, it's a, a little bit of a copy of your proposal, a block diagram, the system requirements, and sort of your preliminary design, your code, a final schematic, and maybe a little film clip of, uh, of your project working and lessons learned. So we'll talk about this. This isn't hard and fixed, but this is kind of what I want you to, to think about submitting most of this information on, on a, you know, in, maybe in a few PowerPoint slides or something. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you about nine suggestions for stuff you can do. Uh, a cipher lock. You can use the touch buttons to input a combination to unlock a cipher lock. Uh, the, you, can, you can actually get a real cipher. You can get a real electronic lock if you want and hack it and substitute yours, or you can just get, uh, you can get a little relay and a, uh, you, can, I, I, you can even get just a deadbolt that, that throws and unthrows based on a, on a DC value controlled by a relay or controlled by a solid state relay. You can display on the LCD is the code that's input. If it's correct and the status, whether the lock is locked or whether you opened it, you can use the push button to enter a new correct code. And then there's some also, there's lots of enhancements you can do to make it even cooler. You can, you can have, uh, you can have a normal secret unlock code uh, that, that, that whoever's going to unlock the lock has to know, but you can also have a, a, one, a, a, one, a one use code that uh, once it's put in, you can program it in. Once it's used to unlock the lock, then, then, it's, then it's basically a race and it won't work again. And that's where you can you know, let a friend into your house, but you don't have to worry about them you know, somebody else got in the code and, you know, coming in at other times. And, and um, you, can let, uh, you can let the push button bring up a menu to choose between the normal code and the one-time code. Uh, you, can, you can lock the lock by having the user press any uh, two particular touch pads at the same time, uh, but they can't unlock it that way. Then to unlock it, they have to put the code in. And the code can be variable length just to make it difficult to, to guess at it. Um, Simon says you can use the colors of red, blue, and green plus white. White's pretty easy to distinguish. If you try and do blue, green, and red, green, and red, blue, those are, can be those can be hard to see sometimes. So, but if you do red, blue, green, and white, those are very distinguishable. And you can display start with maybe a three color sequence, and then have the user push the U, T, S, and A buttons in in an order. And you can you can have a you can blink the LED each time it gets one, and then if they get the right answer, they can blink uh, green, and if they get the wrong answer, they can blink red. And if they, get the, if they get the green blink, then you can give them a new sequence and add one more color, and you can set up a little random number generator. There's actually a, uh, there's actually a, a library function in C for the, for the pick that lets you do that. And then if the code is wrong, you can start over uh, with a new code and a new sequence. Uh, you can ha you should be able to display your score and the instructions on the LCD or a terminal window if you want to use the CR2102. Uh, and then enhancements, you could uh, you could uh, you could give the instructions. You could show them what colors are encoded on the LCD. You could display that so they could they if they forgot they could look at the LCD and remember. And then whenever it's wrong, you could show them how what they did that got it wrong. Uh, that would be kind of cool. You could also keep a score. All right, uh, ultrasonic tape measure using the ping sensor. I'll give you one uh, to use, or you, you can buy one. Uh, interface it, display the distance on the LCD display. And uh, enhancements, uh, so you can improve the user interface, make it a little fancier and cooler. You can have touch buttons to lock the reading when touched, you, so that uh, you hold it, get the reading, hit a touch button, and then it locks in, and then you can go read it. Uh, you can have touch buttons change from inches to centimeters, uh, and back, uh, those are some enhancements you could do. Uh, real-time clock, you can use a real-time clock module. I've got those, you can, you, can, uh, you can borrow it or you can buy one. Uh, interface it and display the information on an LCD. Bring in the code uh, to set using touch buttons. Uh, so, 
so when you get the module, it, it just starts. It just starts off from, I forget what year and date, but it yeah, it uh, it doesn't know when it is. So you have to actually set it so it knows what time it is. And then once you do that, it'll continue to keep the time. It's got a built-in oscillator and it's got a built-in rechargeable battery. So as long as you you don't leave it un unpowered for forever, uh, you know, as long as you leave it unpowered for maybe overnight or a couple of days, uh, the battery, if it gets charged up enough, then it, it'll run it for probably several weeks. So, um, so, so once you set it, you should be good. You can put in an alarm, so you can set a, an alarm, and you can even add a little piezo buzzer that you can drive with your two transistor switch that's on your Viva board um, that comes out through that green terminal. And if you uh, drive it at five volts, that may not be good enough, but if you drive it at maybe a little higher voltage, remember the battery voltage, what you have plugged into the, to the, to the, the female 2.1 millimeter plug, that's what comes out of the green terminal. Uh, so, um, if, yeah. so if you use a 9 volt battery, of course that will eventually run down. So you might, you might need like a little uh, uh, plug-in power supply that's at 9 volts. That would work great. A lot of the cell phone chargers used to be 9 volts. You probably got an old one of those just lying around. Um, uh, you can, you can uh, enhancements. The, this real-time clock also has an I2C. To the, it's it's uh, addressed with I2C, and it's got a slave address. But there's also, on those same boards, there's a little um, EEPROM that's also I2C addressed. And so you can actually store a bunch of information in that. You can uh, have it so you can put in a do list or something. That would be a nice enhancement. Uh, you can use the RGB LED to show if the alarm is set and if it's AM or PM. So it might be red if the alarm set um, and uh, maybe uh, 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 and then maybe uh, add the green LED if it's uh, AM and the uh, uh, blue LED if it's PM. So you can, you can look and see whether it's your alarm set and you can see whether it's AM or PM. Um, all right. GPS. You can interface a GPS module. I've got several of those. Uh, it's, it communicates with UART, but you can actually split your UART up. You can have the receive part of the UART get the information from the GPS and the transmit part of your UART send it out uh, well, you can use, uh, if you use an L LCD, you're using I2C, so that's no problem. But if you use an, you could also do it on a terminal with your CR2102, and you could just use the transmit feature on that uh, 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 going to the, uh, uh, going to the uh, um, terminal window. So you can use touch buttons to save two points and then calculate the distance between them, stand at one point, then walk to another point and hit, hit, hit the first button at the first point, second button at the second point, and then it read out the distance on your LCD display. Or you can use your buttons to change from degrees, minutes, seconds, to degrees, and then fractional degrees. Um, a lot of programs use degrees and fractional degrees and not degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, you can add a Bluetooth feature to one of the lab programs uh, and display results on your cell phone. Uh, can display remote temperature. Uh, you can draw can draw a solid state relay through your Bluetooth. Um, and again, I've got those parts, both the solid state relays and the Bluetooth dongles we have. Uh, again, you can build that incubator I talked about earlier. Uh, you can use your pot on your analog board to set the temperature, and and display that on your LCD display. Uh, you can build a little styrofoam box with a 60 watt bulb in it, kind of tape it together. And then you can you can put a loaf of bread in to rise, or you can put a some uh, some chicken eggs in that are fertilized to hatch. Um, and um, and then you can write a little simple control algorithm to uh, to turn the light on when it's too cold, to turn the light off when it's too hot. And uh, a 60 watt bulb and a styrofoam box will heat it up pretty fast. You can use an RFID reader with the Viva board. I've got those, and I uh, have a bunch of little tag, uh, little, the little tags it can read. And uh, basically, you can just you can display the tag number on an LCD or a terminal program. And enhancements, you can hook this up with a cipher lock and let the uh, let the RFID reader read a correct tag, and it'll open up the lock. Um, and you can also um, you can uh, save uh, how many times. If you have four or five tags, you could set those in your EEPROM and then 
and then keep track of how many tags each one of those has been seen. And that data would stay even when you turn your, your Viva board off if you use the uh, on-chip EEPROM. Um, I have these NEC interface remote controls. It's a little re remote controller and it comes with a IR LED that can pick up the signals. You hook up the IR LED to your Viva board and then you have your little NEC remote control. You have to put a little battery in that and then you can walk around and as long as it can see the IR signal, you can, uh, you can remote control it from, you know, just like you can your television from, you know, 15, 20 feet away. Uh, the NEC uh, protocol is uh, well documented and I'll help you with that, uh, but you don't have a module to decode it. So what you have to do is you have to bit bang it. You have to write a little timed routine and, and read, the, read the, uh, the, the, the data coming from the, from the IR LED. And basically uh, you, you have to, to read how long it's, it indicates it's receiving a one, how long it's receiving nothing, how long it's receiving the next one and so forth. And then you can turn that into using the NEC protocol you can turn that into which button is pressed on the remote control. And there's a whole bunch of buttons on the remote control. Um, and again, I have those parts too. All right. Another thing you can do, you can get buy a little toy car, or probably have one sitting around that has a little simple remote control. And uh, you can take that remote control and hack it. You can interface your Viva board to the remote control. And, uh, and then the Viva board can be programmed to run the car through a set, uh, set, uh, you know, uh, routine basically, or uh, enhancements. You can uh, you can uh, hook in a, a a Bluetooth and talk to your cell phone and control the car from your cell phone. That's that could be kind of cool. All right, so those are some of the things that uh, that yeah I want I visualize doing, and uh, so. Um, all right. Well, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. So I'll post this video and uh, hopefully this will give you some inspiration to uh, flush out your uh, proposal. And you pretty much completed all the lab. So this is what we're going to do for the rest of the year. And, and anytime you want, if you can't come in and get help in lab, that's fine. Uh, I will set up a Zoom time and I'll help you on Zoom. Um, I've learned how to to have you share your screen, but then give me remote control, and I can I can actually scroll through your your software in your uh, MP Lab X and and uh, figure out what's wrong, and you can get a second camera and put it on your your Viva board and your little hardware setup, and and hopefully we can figure it out with that. And actually, it works pretty well. All right, with that, I'm going to quit, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this will help.